When people think of unusual pets, they typically picture reptiles or exotic animals, but not insects. However, a man from Japan claims to have chosen the most aggressive insect in the world as his pet, the deadly Japanese giant hornet. These formidable creatures measure about 2 inches in length and zip through the air at speeds of up to 25 miles per hour. They're notorious for their really strong stingers. In Japan, each summer, these hornets kill around 40 people. That's because hefty and aggressive insects sport 0.2-inch stingers. With these impressive stingers, they deliver venom that targets the nervous system and damages the victim's tissues. Their stings can trigger severe reactions in people who are allergic to the venom, and in those who aren't allergic, a sufficient dose can even lead to fatal kidney failure. In other words, a few stings from these Japanese giant hornets can be lethal, even if you're perfectly healthy. The high mortality rate makes these hornets the second deadliest animal in Japan. Who got the top spot? People. You realize how serious this is, right? Nevertheless, a social media user in Tokyo claims to have successfully trained a hornet to the point where he can now take it out for a walkie in a harness. The man explains that he caught the hornet using a butterfly net and then used tweezers to remove its stinger and poison sacs. Even at this stage, you might be thinking, what? He then attached a thin lead thread to the insect's thorax, and now the harmless hornet follows him around. Well, when I say harmless, the owner mentions that sometimes the pet bites, but it's not very painful. Nevertheless, there are people who think that this might be a prank, suggesting that the hornet seen in the many photos is actually dead. They have a point, since a fierce creature like this wouldn't just chill out after losing its stinger. Removing a stinger is called a discretionary invasive procedure, which falls under the same category as common pet surgery such as cropping and neutering. You've probably heard about the process of wing clipping for birds in captivity. It involves clipping their feathers, not their bones, which temporarily prevents them from flying freely. The feathers naturally regrow after molting, and then the birds may require another clipping. This procedure is commonly carried out by vets, breeders, and people who own birds. It involves the practice of trimming the wings of pet birds, including chickens and certain parrot species, Regardless of the technique used, they can all have adverse effects on the birds, including the risk of falling, increased stress, and changes in behavior. Think of it like suddenly taking away a person's ability to walk properly. Nobody would enjoy that, right? When the birds with clipped wings go through molting, their new feathers, known as blood feathers, can become exposed. These special feathers are different from regular ones because they have a blood circulation. If you accidentally damage one of these blood feathers during clipping, it's likely to bleed a lot. While some people think that trimming a bird's wings can help avoid indoor accidents like getting tangled in ceiling fans or hitting windows, many vets remain opposed to this practice. Another procedure that birds undergo is beak trimming. It's often carried out in places like zoos and rehab centers. This practice aims to prevent birds from pecking each other or pulling out feathers, which can lead to injuries, cannibalism, or even death. Shortening the beak is seen as a safer alternative. However, there are irresponsible people who trim wild birds' beaks to make them more suitable as pets. It's essential to note that beak trimming is often carried out without anesthesia, which can lead to stress and both immediate and chronic pain in birds. When the sensory receptors in a bird's beak are damaged, it can result in a loss of sensation and difficulties in using their beaks for basic tasks affecting their eating and other everyday activities. Birds may also develop nerve tumors known as neuromas after beak trimming, again causing chronic pain. Beak trimming is a common procedure in the poultry industry, often carried out on laying hens and turkeys, and occasionally on quail and ducks. Typically, the birds' beaks are permanently shortened when they're quite young. The primary goal is to minimize the risk of the birds causing harm to one another or humans. It's important to note that, despite its apparent rationale, this practice is illegal in numerous countries. When it comes to slow lorises, things are quite different. People often take out their teeth, thinking it'll make them more docile. Spoiler alert, it doesn't work. Slow lorises are a hot commodity in the exotic pet and tourist industry because of their adorable looks and big eyes. This demand is not limited to their native lands, but spreads to faraway countries as well. What's surprising is that, despite their cuteness, slow lorises are the only venomous primates in the world, 
so their bites can be quite painful. Thankfully, slow lorises don't use venom like snakes do. They have venom glands in the crooks of their arms, and when they feel threatened, they lick these glands to put venom on their teeth. Sadly, exotic animal traders often pull out or clip the teeth of slow lorises, a very painful procedure that's done without anesthesia. This strips these animals of their sole natural defense, leaving them defenseless, like teddy bears. This is what toothless slow lorises look like. If you're unaware of the hardships these poor creatures have endured, you might find it adorable, but personally, these pictures give me the creeps. People often remove the teeth of slow lorises, which are bred as pets for humans. This is especially common when these lorises are used as illegal props in photography, ensuring that the animals won't cause any discomfort to customers paying for selfies with them. What makes it worse is that the painful tooth removal procedure often leads to significant blood loss, infections, and tragically, death for the lorises. Toothless animals that manage to survive can no longer go back to the wild and find food on their own. <laughs> but it's not only the slow lorises that suffer because people get rid of their teeth. Removing the teeth of capuchin monkeys is a common practice among owners. This is usually done for a few reasons. Firstly, it's because these monkeys might end up nibbling on their own teeth, which can be harmful. Additionally, their teeth can lead to bacterial infections, so most capuchin owners opt to have them removed in advance. But there's another reason for this procedure as well. Sometimes capuchin monkeys can suddenly turn aggressive towards their owners and bite them, even if they acted normally before. These bites are painful and can be quite unpleasant. To add to the concern, monkeys can carry some serious diseases like rabies and hepatitis B. So by removing their teeth, people are essentially making their lives safer. The question that remains is why people choose to keep a wild animal as a pet, especially when it requires such sacrifice. Animals are always the ones who suffer in such scenarios. The Cambodian authorities seized a pet lion without teeth and claws weighing 154 pounds that was featured in a TikTok video. This animal had been unlawfully kept in a residence in the capital city of Phnom Penh after being imported by a Chinese national for domestic raising. Upon closer inspection, it became evident that the lion was declawed and defanged, apparently for safety reasons. Naturally, a lion lacking these essential features couldn't lead a normal and happy life. This particular lion got lucky as it was confiscated and relocated to the Wildlife Rescue Center. Unfortunately, sending it back to the wild is not an option, and even in a zoo or reserve, it would face challenges due to its lack of fangs and claws for self-defense against other lions. However, the issue of removing claws extends beyond cruelty, affecting all felines in general. Declawing process involves removing the last bone at the knuckle of each finger. Cats mostly walk on their toes, so removing a toe forces them to shift their weight onto the bones and muscles not naturally suited for the purpose. This leads to a higher risk of arthritis as they strain their paws. When it comes to canine teeth, there's not much to explain. Oh, one thing, if the fangs aren't removed, they might get dull, which isn't great either. The teeth can wear out and even start to decay, leading to all sorts of problems. Snakes also haven't been spared from becoming convenient pets. There's even a specific term for it, venomoid, which refers to a venomous snake that's undergone surgery to lose its venomous bite. This procedure is done for snakes kept as pets or used in public shows to ensure people's safety. Unfortunately, not much thought is given to the snakes themselves. The process involves removing venom glands or fangs, though removing the fangs is less common since snakes can regrow their teeth. It's crucial to note that you can't entirely take out the bone from which these teeth grow as it would be fatal for the snake. So most of the procedure involves either removing the venomous gland or severing the connection between the gland and the fang. In simple terms, the goal is to stop the venom from reaching the point where the snake can bite you. However, it's important to note that in some countries, performing such procedures may be against the law, and it doesn't change the status of a venomous snake in the eyes of the law. By the way, remember what I said about clipping the wings and how it doesn't affect the bones? Well, here's something worse. People sometimes surgically remove a joint in a bird's wing that's farthest from its body. They do this for the same reason. And it's a practice commonly performed on waterfowl, domestic birds, and, believe it or not, parrots. Taking out a bird's joint puts a stop to feather growth, leaving it unable to generate the thrust required for flight, almost like severing a human hand at the wrist. Yeah, it's this nasty. 
Let's take a look. The right wing of this bird underwent surgery while the left one didn't. However, this alone prevents it from flying due to the disrupted balance. It's widely recognized that besides stopping the birds from flying, if done correctly at an early age, the procedure doesn't have any lasting negative impacts. However, there's a growing debate about how it affects animal well-being. For instance, we now know that the procedure can be very painful, and birds don't receive any anesthesia. There's also evidence that this practice can lead to a phantom limb sensation, much like what some people experience after amputation. Although in many countries there are strict rules against it, only trained experts can perform it or it's only allowed when the birds are very young. What truly surprised me was the fact that some people rob the birds of their voice. That's absurd. Well, sometimes being visually striking is all people want from these birds. Their loud calls and singing can be seen as annoying by their owners, leading them to consider a special procedure. This procedure, known as devoicing, is quite complex and risky. Unlike mammals, birds lack vocal cords and they create sounds through delicate movements and air vibrations in their chests. As a result, taking away a bird's voice without endangering its life is nearly impossible. However, it's not just exotic pet enthusiasts who opt for this procedure, it's also done on roosters. Regrettably, there's an unsettling statistic here. Between 70 and 80% of roosters subjected to this operation don't survive. They usually fall victim to secondary infections or airway blockage caused by swelling. Only a small fraction, approximately 20 to 30%, manage to pull through. But why does it continue? The explanation is quite simple. Most owners aren't informed about the risks, but they're promised that their birds will be less noisy. With all this in mind, removing skunk scent glands seems much less crazy. In the case of pet skunks bred in captivity, these glands are surgically taken out to ensure they don't cause any discomfort to their owners. This procedure stirs up some debate as some people worry that it robs the pet skunk of an essential self-defense tool. Even though there might not be any threats around the house, if the skunk happens to venture outside and faces an attack, it won't have its glands to protect itself. Out in the wild, a skunk like that wouldn't stand a chance, and it could end up there anytime. The Struggles of Pet Ownership Wild animals must stay in the wild. They can't become pets primarily because people often can't offer them the proper care they require. According to research by the British Veterinary Association, over half of exotic pets have unmet welfare needs. Additionally, 9 out of 10 vets highlighted unsuitable living conditions and 85% pointed out inappropriate dietary practices. Perhaps most worrisome is that 62% of these vets reported that these animals frequently endure pain, injuries, and illness due to a lack of adequate care. And we're not even talking about demanding animals like lions or monkeys, but tiny pets like snakes and geckos. Reptile Responsibility Not too long ago in Florida, reptile keepers were mandated to microchip their animals, much like the common practice of microchipping dogs and cats around the globe. We still don't think it's a good idea to keep lizards as pets, given their inherently wild nature. Nevertheless, microchipping does no harm to the reptile and offers potential benefits in case the pet goes missing. This intervention can be seen as promoting responsible ownership. Still untamed. Yes, I'll just keep saying this over and over again. And now we've got the science to back it up. Think about it. Lots of people have pets, whether it's a dog, a cat, or even a cow. These animals have a calmer stress response system in their bodies compared to their wild counterparts like wolves, lions, or buffaloes. As a result, our typical pets like dogs, cats, and cows are far less likely to become agitated and harm humans in contrast to their wild counterparts. They aren't prone to attacking at all, unlike their wild relatives who can and will attack. It's not the animal's fault. Over thousands of years of living alongside humans, domesticated animals have been purposely bred to get along with us. In other words, we've spent thousands of years making them capable of living peacefully and safely with us. Wild animals, on the other hand, haven't followed the same path, so they can't behave in the same way. Even if you adopt them at a young age, or if wild animals grow up among humans for generations and seem tame, they'll still retain their wild instincts and react like wild animals when stressed. That's just the way nature works. See you later.